Establish your reputation as a formidable warrior by brutally slaughtering unruly peons. Prove your ability as a righteous leader with your selfish pursuit of money and power. Restore the honour of your clan by butchering trade caravans and looting all of their stuff. Valiantly do battle with your enemies because you can make a fucking stack of cash ransoming them back to their dad. Take a moral stand against your foes by burning their villages and murdering their peasants. Uphold the values of justice and righteousness using a ridiculous amount of indiscriminate violence and brutality. Welcome to Mountain Blade 2, Bannerlord, where being a sadistic bastard is its own reward. War is such an overly romanticised and glorified endeavour. It's the stuff of songs, poems and epic ballads of heroism. In fact, warfare, and particularly historic wars, are one of the most inaccurately portrayed and misrepresented aspects of culture. I can think of few other things that are so widely represented in a generally positive and adventurous light, which when experienced by the average person, turn out to be so shit. Well, with the possible exception of marrying the hottest girl in your town, owning an exotic foreign sports car and screwing the babysitter. Just like war, all these activities seem like a brilliant idea at the time, right up until the moment when you have to face the consequences of your decisions. I guess part of our addiction to a romanticised vision of warfare is rooted deep in our psyche. It's the folly of man to always assume that we are the lead character in the movie of our life and it's some other random guy who is the red shirt. You know, the guy who will catch the bullet. Unfortunately, whoever you are and however important you may think you are, for someone out there in the world right this moment, you are nothing more than just a red shirt in their movie. For many people who have never experienced war, it must seem like one giant fucking orgy of heroism, excitement and adventure, where everyone is home in time for tea and medals, bad things only happen to the bad guys, and our side always wins. Sadly however, war is now and has traditionally always been primarily an activity where poor people fight to protect the interests of rich people. It's brutal, cruel, sadistic, and in video games, often perversely enjoyable. In real life, well, not so much. War is also primarily an endeavour where money, politics and power is a currency traded for and critically essential to success. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is a game that attempts to draw all these strands together into a coherent video game. A game which tries to simulate the material, political and economic practicalities of early medieval warfare, whilst at the same time positioning the player as the hero and trying to make the combat visceral, brutal, exciting and yes, perversely good fun. So I guess we should take a look at precisely what this game is all about and how it tries to combine these somewhat conflicting but nevertheless highly entertaining goals. Video quality warning. Due to an early access issue causing a conflict with my Nvidia settings, 
this game decided to capture all my footage in a video standard used by a 1980s Russian state broadcaster. Apologies for the strange video quality. At least it's still in colour. Mostly. So what is Mountain Blade 2, colon, Bannerlord? Well, according to my professional exhaustive research and copy and pasted text from Wikipedia, Mountain Blade 2, colon, Bannerlord is an action role-playing video game developed by Tail Worlds Entertainment, a game that I will now refer to as Bannerlord. It's a giant open world, ultra sandbox adventure, RPG, resource management, strategic and tactical, war, politics, economy, pillaging and peasant slaughtering simulator, set just after the fall of the Roman Empire. You kill, loot, wage war, get your ass kicked and engage in empire building. But early game, you mostly ride around, wearing a loincloth, trying not to get killed by gangs of fucking stinking peons who have slightly better item level loincloths than you. Like most good RPGs, at its heart, it's a rags to riches story. Only this time around the Maypole, you almost literally start out in rags. Bannerlord is developed and published by Tail Worlds Entertainment, who were the people behind the original Mountain Blade game and some of its sequels slash DLCs. It's a prequel that takes place 200 or so years prior to Mountain Blade in the early 11th century in the fictional land of Calradia during the non-fictional medieval era known as the Migration Period. The best way to understand Calradia is to think of the fictional amalgam world you get in Red Dead Redemption 2, where they created a game world that mashed together elements of the whole of the Americas by taking little stereotypical chunks of different regions of the continent and gluing them together into the space of a very small state. It's a bit like Westworld, a miniaturised fictional game world that is kind of historically accurate, but fictional and overly diverse at the same time. Different areas of the map are populated by different apparently historically semi-accurate factions and tribes of the period, and for the purposes of a video game provides a relatively well textured and varied experience, compressed into a space which is both big enough to seem enormous, but small enough that you don't have to play for two hours just to get from one goat fucking hovel to the next. The other way to describe it is this, it's like some space aliens kidnapped a few thousand people from some kingdoms across Europe and the Middle East and set them down in an area that kinda looks a bit like a miniaturised, vaguely wrong drawing of Asiatic Turkey. Like if you got your mate to draw it in the pub when he was pissed. You know, it's basically better than I can draw Turkey, but still wrong. Oh yeah, the developer is from Turkey. It's starting to come together now. Look, I don't know geography, history, or for that matter, video games, but I think you get the general picture. It was that time when they had swords, horses, and chainmail, and everyone owned pigs. I am new to this franchise, and this is my first Mountain Blade experience, but I'm reliably informed by the always trusty internet which I trust completely and totally uncritically that this is a much loved franchise and a much anticipated sequel. It's currently retailing as PC Early Access on Steam at the £40 price point. It's getting patched very regularly and unlike many Early Access games, it actually fucking runs. And I played it a fair amount to be honest because unlike most video games these days, it's not a pile of generic overpriced shite. So far, so not shite. Bannerlord is getting shit-kicking reviews on Steam and a generally very positive reception across the board. It was the biggest launch on Steam this year and at one point had 200,000 concurrent players. And yes, I copied that bit from Wikipedia too. So what is all the hype about and why are so many people getting excited about this game? Warning, at this point I do need to issue a general warning about this game as a personal investment. 
This preliminary review is for an early access game, which comes with associated risk. They might patch it and your save games will be lost. Your save games might just corrupt for fucking lols. They might nerf your favourite unit. They might not even finish making the game. This is not a judgement on Tale World's entertainment or indeed Bannerlord. It's just the price of doing business with any early access title, and also why I rarely fucking touch them. However, in 2019, Deep Rock Galactic and Breath Edge were both early access titles, and they were frankly excellent. So Bannerlord appears to be good enough to warrant investigation, but be warned, this is definitely early access and the game is a bit rough. Barely any of the NPC interactions have voice recordings, perhaps none, and the game feels a bit bare bones. All this being said, however, there was enough here to make the game very playable already. So let's talk business. As the YouTuber might say to the community manager. So what were my first impressions? Well, it was fucking boring, and I didn't understand what the fuck was going on. No, seriously, for the first few hours I wondered what in hell's name I had just spunked my money on. Admittedly, I got it for 33-ish pounds during the discount launch sale, but nevertheless, during the first couple of hours, I was worried that I would have been smarter spending that money on some pics from iDub's girlfriend's OnlyFans account and keeping the change for pie and chips. And a bottle of gin. At the start, you get a shitty little tutorial and then get dumped in some shithole village and pretty much told to find some shit and find some shitheads in the village of Shitsville. Some of which said shit turns out to be not in the village, but outside, which you find via the minimap. A clue would have been nice, just maybe one clue, one clue for every 15 minutes of pointless running around the fucking village would have been nice. Fuck me angrily with a cactus twice, the tutorial didn't fill me with optimism. I spent half an hour lost in a village trying to find some grain, only to realise I was in the wrong screen, then spent another hour lost in the village trying to locate some villagers, then realised I was in the wrong screen. This was less of a tutorial, and more like a demotivating puzzle. In the end, I gave up and watched a YouTube guide. Yeah, I watched a YouTube guide for the first tutorial in a fucking video game. I'm sorry, but tutorials are supposed to tutor you. If your tutorial is so ball-breaking you need to watch a tutorial on the tutorial, it's not really a tutorial. I completely appreciate that I am very, very stupid indeed, and I know I do myself zero favours by ignoring tips, missing obvious clues, and then regularly skipping through half the text in instructions. But fuck, it was not a good start, even by my idiotic numbnuts standards. However, after a bit of sobbing on the shoulder of my inflatable companion and a few YouTube guides later, I found the sacks of grain, finished the opening quests and then immediately lost my brother and then got lost myself and started to pootle around the open world like the fucking clueless peon that I most absolutely was being. I would, however, like to note at this point that eventually... After many, many hours of clueless and almost entirely discombobulated bimbling and trial and error, I started to understand a bit about the game. And then eventually, at some later point, I started to appreciate that Bannerlord is an immersive, no fucks given, unguided and barely scripted Genghis Khan simulator. Okay, it's pronounced Chingus. Then, at this point, the penny dropped, and I started to like it. And I mean, I really started to obsess over this game. Functionality and a fuckery. Well, it's not an Epic Game Store exclusive. Sad that this is now a selling feature of video games, but let's face it, 
It is. Callum, one of the developers, was even reassuring people on the Steam forums last year that they would flick the Epic Game Store check over the table all the way back to fucking China. So credit to them for that. The character creation functionality was one of the most exhaustive and detailed I've seen in a while. There are sliders for pretty much everything. You can literally create the most heroic or most grotesque character that your heart desires. You can literally create the woman or man of your dreams. Move forth! And I have some pretty strange dreams. The game even makes you choose aspects of the character's backstory which contributes to their ultimate core stats. There is definitely potential to have some fun with this. The key rebinding was one of those horrible sliding tile puzzle affairs. You couldn't rebind anything that was already assigned so you had to go and find that thing, bind it to a random key, then go back and rebind the thing you were trying to rebind before you unbound the keybind. There is no logical fucking reason to do it this way. Just let people rebind a fucking key, automatically unbind the other thing, and give the player a warning that something is now not bound, and flag it in red. Easy. This is basic industry standard functionality and requires no thinking. There was a choice, a good way and a stupid way, and somebody chose to implement the way that fucking winds me up to an incredible and spectacular fucking degree. This is annoying to rebinders like myself. The tutorial, in-game guidance and general nudging and prompts needs work. Christ, it pretty much needs starting. But fuck, I guess the game isn't finished yet, so logically it makes sense to finalise the game first and deal with the guides and tutoring afterwards. But if you get the game, repeat the words early access five times in your head before starting a new campaign and get ready to google some pointers, because the game will largely let you fly blind. Like, literally let you fly blind into the side of a mountain, or just out to sea never to be found. This game does not seem to be that optimised computationally. Fuck, it seemed to thrash my CPU and GPU, and sometimes when you hit certain buttons the whole PC would lock for 10 seconds, with a little light on the front of the PC frozen in the thinking hard position. Actually, looking at the numbers, this game pretty much thrashed my PC at close to maximum computational fuckery levels. Like, smoke blowing out the fucking vents. I have a reasonable PC and a decent graphics card, but the game in its current state just seemed to want to use 100% of the resources for the most random reason. I have recently heard that they are working hard to optimise the game in the near future. I can't verify that first hand, but the fact that they're trying to optimise the game and reduce the strain on PC resources before launch at least puts it a head and shoulders above the quality of Ubisoft games these days. I'm not particularly concerned about this. I only mention it because it's something people might have to put up with for a while, or at least until a later build comes out. There was a distinct absence of hand-holding, and I'm not sure how much was deliberate and how much was just the fact that the game ain't finished. Walking into a city for the first time, you get no tips, markers, guides, maps, mini-maps, or explanations. So I found myself wandering around aimlessly like a fucking tit, trying to find if there was even anything to do. It's not like when you want to head to the smithy you can just walk there. You don't even know where the fuck it is. Thank God for the leave key. At any time, you can just pound tab and find yourself outside without the shag of a long walk home. Over time, I eventually found ways to go directly where I wanted to go from the external options and realised I had largely been fumbling around in the dark, doing things the wrong way. However, I have seen other people doing the same mistakes in their videos, so even if I am being a fucktard, it's evidence that there are not enough idiot prompts in-game. 
I also later discovered other helping functionality like hitting alt, highlights NPC locations and that you can flag people in the encyclopedia and then look for them. But there were no ways to logically join the dots in your head without a prompt or tutorial. I discovered most of this shit by trial and error, guide videos, or didn't discover it at all and I'm still doing it wrong now. I think when the game is finished, there are more town NPCs to interact with and stuff to discover in the city. Wandering around aimlessly won't feel like a waste of time. But in its current state, yeah, I wasted some time pointlessly there, only later to notice I could just select this shit I needed to do directly from the first town menu and thus avoid choking back a huge slice of fuckery pie. When I eventually got to grips with this game, I found lots of decent functionality that let you interact with people without physically having to fuck yourself around in the city and find them. I thought this was a decent quality of life function that traded one loading screen weight for passing on a whole load of wasted time and fuckery. Nicely done, to be honest. In fact, when I was keybinding right at the start of the game, I noticed the conspicuous leave button was front and centre. I thought that was odd to even have as a bindable key, but I get it now. I totally get it. But to pick up on an important point, to make it easier to learn and to apply certain abilities and functionality, there needs to be more ways to join the dots. It's one thing to be told that a certain thing exists at the start of the game, but this won't result in you knowing when to use it for hours later in a battle. This needs to be thought through because the game is vastly more deep than you realise at first. Fuck, I'm still regularly finding new things in game and I'm assuming this will be the case beyond the 100 hours mark. There is no doubt that you will start out playing this game fumbling around in the dark. It's just how this kind of game plays, especially in an unfinished state. As time progresses and you explore the UI, things will get easier and you will learn more about what you can do. There are some nice little touches that once you learn them will save you a lot of ball ache. There is huge time saving functionality when you find it and this is yet another reason why everyone should be periodically doing a scan over their UI to see if there is any stuff that now makes more sense since last time you stared at it and it seemed like a random face fuck of nonsense options. This said the game was stable, ran well enough and looked pretty enough. But my overall takeaway was that this game was a bit of a steep learning curve and that curve is made steeper by its rough state and almost total lack of explanation. However, I still really wanted to learn and kept playing despite these faults because they're always seem to be a reward for the hard work. So what's my evaluation of the game? It's big, it's got deep mechanics, it's a game that gives no fucks about telling you where to go, what to do or indeed how to do it. But I went from completely uninfuckingpressed to hooked in about 5 hours. And I would note that some of my favourite games of all time, like Kingdom Come Deliverance and Fallout 3, did precisely the same. Sometimes games that are difficult to get into, for the very same reasons, have sufficient depth to keep you playing for many hundreds or even over a thousand hours. This game was a slow burner for me, the tutorial pissed me off and then I got dumped in a world and just told, get on with it. Get on with what exactly? The first fight I picked, I didn't realise that for some reason I had zero troops and ended up trying to solo a bunch of bandit tards and ended up as a prisoner. Near the start, there was a moment where I genuinely questioned what I had got myself embroiled with. I keep hearing people use the word sandbox and I see why. It really is. Look, it must be sandbox. It says it right there in words. And not just any words, not just mere mortal words, developer words, made with pixels. It's genuinely open world. Imagine if you started a game of medieval total war where you started out as a character who can just wander across the map for two hours and then set up camp on the complete other side of the map. It's that open world. I've heard several other commentators say that, and I quote, you make your own story. And they're indeed correct. As others have noted, this game does not lay down a very defined path for you to follow. 
it puts down a blank canvas and lets you draw on it. The real story is going on in your head. You have an overarching questline that I have mostly entirely been avoiding, but uh, I'm going to assume that this is the main domination questline. In a way this game is akin to the early Total War games in certain aspects, only now you can get down in the dirt with the men and fight the battles FPS style. Or third person, I'm not viewist. But that's really a core aspect of this game, it's like a military real time strategy game where you can also get down into the game in person Skyrim style and mix it up on the battlefield or in the towns. It's a brilliant convergence of two differing game styles and I really liked it. Imagine preparing your army for a battle just like an RTS game, but then when it kicks off you find yourself literally positioned next to your men down in the battle lines, where you are going to live or die based on your decisions in real time. Are you going to be sensible and hide behind your men and stay safe and well, or are you going to ride ahead and make key contributions to the battle and risk taking an arrow to the knee? For the record, so far when I've lost a battle, I've only ever been taken prisoner and not died. This is a mini adventure in itself and yet another reason why I didn't save scum my way out of it. The thing with this game is that a lot of the joy comes from the investment. It's a bit shit at first and nothing makes sense, it's not very satisfying, but you persevere. Then this moment comes where you win a great battle, take a bunch of decent prisoners, some of whom might join your little army of cunts later, and you hoover up some lovely shiny loot, and then suddenly you find yourself emotionally invested. I started to crave cherry picking that next sweet weapon or taking that bit of shiny armour off my dead foes and putting it on my own as of yet undecapitated head. Be warned, there is a huge grind element to this game. Grind is a core element, you will play, you will grind bandits and scumbags, but you will have to do some repetitive grinding, and I'm talking blue balls levels of grinding. Although I would note that recently I decided to say fuck it and max out the difficulty settings mid playthrough and set death to on. This very much made previously grindy battles much more interesting and a bit of a bigger deal. Taking 70 soldiers against 20 bandits is nothing of note on easy, but on the hardest setting you might end up with one of your favourite units getting insta jibbed and killed just because of a momentary lapse of concentration, and I would advise players to increase difficulty as quickly as they feel comfortable because it gives every battle a real edge and some genuine consequences. Then there was the courtship thing where you could chat up some princess and by repeatedly visiting her and using your charms you could eventually marry her. Apparently. Sadly, my real life charm seemed to directly translate in game and thus far I have universally failed to get my royal leg over. I'm not sure if this is a bad thing mind, since let's be honest, at least one of the princesses looked like, and there's no good way to say this, a 12 year old. Hmm, I think that part of the game requires a little bit of polish. I'm sure this is just a graphical issue and maybe it was the fact that this princess was very short, but yes, I felt a bit shady chatting up some bird who frankly looked like she had skipped out of class to be chatted up by the local warlords. When you're playing something in a video game and you find yourself thinking, fuck I better not screen capture any of this because it looks a bit pedo, well maybe. Just maybe the female models require a bit of work. Although it got a bit grindy at times, I really loved the whole process of picking fights, killing bad guys, grabbing your loot, and spamming up your crew. I loved the whole dress up Barbie element with the armour, weapons, and horses. And on top of this, you can pimp out your companions, you can upgrade your troops as both you and they gain experience. It was very much part of the hook of this game. 
The horse and combat mechanics were a fucking sexual delight. I simply loved the feel of the war horses. That sounded better in my head. And I also delighted in riding rings around the enemy, shooting my bow at peons and generally feeling like a badass. Well, as much as anyone can feel like a badass whilst they are riding around on a war horse, wearing armour and shooting nearly naked peasants in the back with a high power bow, whilst your well trained army mercilessly kills any cunt who so much as throws a lump of dung at you. Seriously though, the general feel and the animations of the horseback combat was a real plus point for me. I haven't really mastered general combat yet and one on one I'm fairly useless in melee, but twatting poor village folk with a polearm or just shooting arrows at them whilst they fled in piss pants panic was one of the finer beauties of this game that I enjoyed savouring. It's hard to evaluate the depth of this game in its current state and at my current skill level it already has a decent amount of depth but you need to factor in that there was stuff I probably completely missed and the game still isn't finished. I'm not using those factors as excuses nor as hollow promises of potential complexity being magically found later. I'm just saying that I can't yet vouch for the finished product because I have a lot to learn and it ain't done being done yet. I will however say that there is a plateau and step up dynamic going on with Bannerlord. I would be trundling along, sometimes getting a little bit tired of the grind I was on and then something would pop up like a siege. Later I would discover that the thief button on the UI now actually did something because I had a thief and could assign a governor. I'm still not exactly sure if this will result in riches or headaches but I rest my case. Things kept coming along and suddenly I was all, I didn't know I could do that. Like Frostpunk, Total War or Fallout, no doubt there will come a point where you will want to start again and do it all over differently, based on all of the new things that you've learned. When I set up my first caravan, I suddenly found that looters and bandits were now a big deal. Up to this point, they'd grown to become a casual target of opportunity and lazy battle XP, but now I was suddenly paranoid about my investment in the caravan and mercilessly hunted every last fucker down who went anywhere near my valuable glass beads and smallpox infested blankets. The blacksmithing minigame looks theoretically interesting. However, it's not like Skyrim where you can fuck off to the smithy with half a bottle of vodka and a wank mag, spam click a thousand daggers and then instantly know how to make the best armour in the game. Currently in game you can barely make a bit of charcoal without gassing out and needing to take a long break, and I'm talking days. I have thus far managed to smelt down a few weapons and make some fucking charcoal. That's pretty much it. Every time you do something you get very tired apparently and have to carry on after a very long forced vacation. I guess it's a realistic time frame for a part time smithy and full time murderer but it's perhaps a little restrictive for a video game. Apparently you can send your companions to do some blacksmithing for you but I haven't figured that bit out yet. Another issue is the difficulty settings and the enable death setting. Personally I started out on easy then as I learned more realised that a big part of the game is getting competent enough to play it on tougher levels with enable death set to on. Once you know what you are doing everything is more exciting when death is a real option and enemy damage is increased. I don't understand the game mechanics enough to fully comprehend the subtlety of the difficulty settings as they are now but I have already YOLO'd the difficulty settings up and the game is better for it. When one enemy peon dickhead can lob one well placed spear and kill your favourite soldier, then suddenly everything is for keeps. This was something I really liked about Kingdom Come Deliverance, the fact that no matter how high level you were, if you fucked up and six heavy duty geezers jumped out of a bush and charged you then failure was not only possible but likely. This survival element is resoundingly worth exploring. It's frankly more exciting knowing that if you make mistakes, members of your crew will be gone for good. 
At the end of the day, I paid a modest amount for this game, and it came fuckery free. It started out slow and made very little sense to me, but the more I played it, the better it got. In fact, so far, it's not stopped getting better. I started out getting lost, trying to find grain, and generally being frustrated and pissed off. But the game paid off for my perseverance, and I found myself wanting to keep playing it to see what was around the next corner. This game keeps opening up to the new player, and the more you advance, the more toys you get to play with. The more you adapt to the game world, you meet more interesting and diverse characters and factions. And kill them, because you want to know what loot they have. Before I knew it, I was becoming very emotionally invested in my ragtag band of warriors and companions. Some I hired, some were prisoners that decided to join me along the road. All of them seemed to have a natural affinity for killing. As they got better and the enemies got harder, I really started to enjoy the carnage on the battlefield. As you gain mastery over the game, you get sucked in further and further. Before you know it, you will be involved in your first siege and face planting over a parapet and helping, or not helping, to storm a castle. You'll be setting up your little fiefdoms and establishing caravan routes for income. I want to keep playing this game, and despite the occasional feeling of grindiness and repetitiveness, I genuinely think they are creating something special here. I want to see where this game goes, and I reckon by the time I've found out, I will want to go back and start it all over again on a fresh playthrough. This is not something I can say about many games these days. Put it this way. I am assuming that I will eventually end up sinking hundreds of hours into this game over the next 12 months. So let's evaluate the game dynamics from an early access perspective. Let's be fair, this game is far from finished, so I don't want to crucify it for things that will likely be changed or possibly improved later. So this list of gripes is going in a separate section and I'm describing it as observations and suggestions. Semantics? Maybe, but fair I reckon. I will issue the caveat that maybe some of the things I mentioned might be the result of my own ignorance. That said, if there are things in the game and they are buried in a way where players can't find them, that is just as much of a problem as them not being there at all. It would be good to be able to sort unit types or sort the stats more efficiently. For example, when you have six different types of horses, if you want to know a simple number like how many total horses do I have, it's a bit of a fucking shag counting it up manually. I couldn't find any other way. Similarly, once you get a multitude of different units from all over the region, including obscure soldier types, just trying to work out your ratio between archers and infantry and cavalry can be a bit laborious. Perhaps I missed a key, perhaps I missed some screen that shows me. If it's not there, it needs to be. And if it is there, they need to point you at it as part of the tutorial. Similarly, I only just found out that donkeys and sumter horses increase army carry capacity and the other horses increase your army speed. Some kind of graphic for that would be nice. Christ, even knowing that would be a boon. I had to find that out from the Steam forums. I really wish there was more self-evident troop control. I've managed to stumble into some of it and it's okay, but let's just say that the interface seemed to be designed by a DOS programmer and it is not really that user-friendly. Fuck, I'll get used to it I'm sure, but I pretty much found it out by accident and always seem to be fumbling with it. Perhaps it's the vodka. But, you know, some presets would be nice. I mean, let's face it, nearly every fucking battle, I always want my archers to spread out. Yet it's a key I have to press at the start every time. The quest structure is a bit, well, thin. At the start, your main quest is to speak to a bunch of guys about some stuff. You don't know who they are, where they are, or what this stuff is really about, but there are ten of them. It's basically just a way to make you fanny about and explore the map. I'm sure it leads to great and wonderful endeavours, and global domination and all that good shit. But, 
Most of the time, I seem to be getting the same couple of quests thrown in my face. Here are some soldiers. Get rid of them. Deal with these thugs. Help me peddle some pigs. Knowing exactly what the quest involves, how much of a shag it will be, and how little reward you will get, doesn't motivate me to do them more than a few times. Especially since some of them get you into trouble with certain people. Perhaps the XP reward is huge. Fuck knows, I didn't check. I'm sure this will be padded out, but more depth to the quests and progression would make the player feel a little less like they are lost in a sparse sandbox. Also, the scaling on lower settings seemed maybe a bit haphazard. As soon as you get a group of 40 to 50 reasonably well-trained guys, it became quite hard to find decent challenging fights. Every potential army target mainly seemed to fall into one or two main groups. A small group of hicks and peons half your size, which use steamroller, or armies 5 to 10 times your size that will steamroller you. It's quite hard trying to peel off a smaller unit from these armies to have a good scrap with. It's okay, and you can find the targets if you hunt and stalk around, but sadly most of the time I seem to be kicking the shit out of helpless groups of peasants just to satisfy my army's bloodlust. Maybe this is deliberate and nurses the players up to higher difficulty settings, but honestly, on the basic settings, it was pretty much just face roll in most battles, or suicide. My top tips, the Mountain Blade 2, colon, Bannerlord. No 21 kiloton review would be complete without some poorly constructed, ill-considered, or likely blindingly obvious advice on how to play a game I haven't even fucking mastered myself. Shame I didn't do that in my Doom Eternal review, really. But then again, my advice would have been, don't fucking buy it, keep playing Doom 2016, and save yourself a giant pile of cash. But I digress. Save regularly. I don't personally save scum, but there will be many moments where you say out loud, I didn't intend to do that, shit. There are bits where there is no confirmation box, so one random click or misclick on the UI might fuck all your money away or plant you somewhere you don't want to be. Or you might engage an enemy thinking a friendly army is in range but they went off for a wank and a nap instead. Save regularly. One time I literally misclicked and unwittingly and permanently pissed away most of my money. I'm not looking for nannying here, but a dialogue box would have been nice. Something along the lines of, Do you really want to piss away most of your cash on this shit you don't want? Click yes. I reckon that would have helped. Buy a fan. Seriously, buy a desk fan to point at the front of your PC to keep it cool. When your cooling fans start to howl and spin up to such immense speeds that any loose bits of paper in your room start getting sucked through the air and into the front of your gaming rig, well, you will regret not taking this advice. Roll on the optimization patch. War is largely a numbers game. Whilst a highly trained and well-led army can beat an opposing force much larger than itself, it's hard to escape the rules of mathematics. An army of idiots throwing rocks and shitting itself can still beat you if you are outnumbered 20 to 1. Because a lot of rocks is a lot of rocks, whether they're being held by idiots or elite troops. That's why riots and the hockey championship celebrations cause such a mess. Having a tactical and numerical advantage will lead to an easy victory. Having a tactical advantage with equal numbers will lead to victory. Having 10 men and taking on a force of 200 will get you fucked up, even if the enemy is made up of mostly goat farmers. In fact, you're going to get worse than fucked up. Let's just say when the fighting is over and you have lost, the goats are going to get a night off. Fortune favours the bold, but fortune laughs at idiots. Don't be that idiot. A valiant battle where you win despite the odds is immensely satisfying. But if you make a habit of doing that shit, soon you won't have much of an army left. 
and you will quickly find yourself down at the soldier shop buying some barely trained idiots which no doubt you'll throw into the fucking meat grinder too. Learn your battlefield hotkeys and commands. Once you get dropped into battle you don't really have long to get set up so you need a few cookie cutter plans in your head to throw down so you don't just get overrun. As a basic rule of thumb, the hammer and the anvil is a basic tactic tried and true in both reality and war games. Have a solid infantry line, place archers behind them, have cavalry, preferably have a reserve unit too. Once the battle is underway, use your cavalry, your reserve or both to smash them in the weakest flank. Ideally you want the bulk of the enemy beating on your infantry shields while being peppered with arrows and have the capacity to hit them in the weak spot at a time most inconvenient to them. Horses are nice. I wouldn't date one but I would certainly take it for a ride. I like walking as much as the next fat lazy arsehole who doesn't like exercise. Make sure you have lots of horses, at least one horse for every single member of your war party and some spare. Don't challenge me on the science because I don't know the math. Last time I counted on my fingers someone asked me why I was counting in base 6. Just trust me, horse is good, walking bad. Don't believe me? Just try chasing down a group of step bandits when most of your pig fuckers are all on foot. Remember that more horses help, apparently donkeys help carry stuff and a surplus of horses help even more. Pay attention to your stats when you click stuff because stuff might be happening that the game won't tell you about. A perfect example was beer and olives. It was only by chance that I noticed that whilst my army was perfectly well fed on just grain, when I sold off my beer, olives and dates the army morale dropped. Make sure you have nice things, soldiers like nice things and if soldiers are happy you get a leadership XP bonus. See where I'm going here? It has definite RPG elements buried deep in the mechanics. So when you're doing stuff, keep an eye on the UI just to see if anything is changing. Following from this, apparently having pigs in your army boosts morale. Hey, who am I to judge? However, unconfirmed reports claim that the livestock slows down your army, so butcher it and turn it into meat. Livestock and horses apparently can be butchered and eaten. Keep studying the game and watching guides. I shamefully discovered entire character point attributes and mechanics which were sitting under my nose for days completely unused. So far I have rarely watched a guide that didn't give me some tip that was useful or at the very least interesting. Periodically butcher some peons. It's a sad truth, but if you're going to roam around the countryside with a bloodthirsty army of hired killers and scum, occasionally you have to let them blow off some steam, especially now that you've slaughtered all the pigs. Periodically provide your troops with some quality recreation and entertainment time. Obviously by that I mean pick a fight with some looters or bandits and let your highly trained group of killers totally slaughter a handful of pitchfork waving pilgrims. If you're going to go on long treks through the wilderness morale will suffer so turn that frown upside down very literally by inverting some peasant's severed head and sticking it on the end of a fucking pike. Learn what weapons work for you. Some basic advice however, it will surprise nobody that decent armour, decent horse armour and a decent horse will help. After this it's up to you how you fight in the battle but let's just say it's highly likely that you will end up converging on some combination of bow and one handed polearm. It's piss easy kiting around the enemy line and shooting them in the back, it's a winning formula. With melee however I found it bloody hard to fight with a sword 
because you have to swing it just at the right moment. Fuck, I found it hard fighting with a spear. The one-handed polearm, however, is easy mode. It's basically a big meat cleaver attached to the end of a stick. If you can't hit some cunt with that, you might as well take a nap during your battles. Seriously though, I've seen a lot of people playing this game with some kind of polearm on horseback, and now I see why. Hitting moving targets whilst you are also moving with a three foot long club requires a lot of skill and timing. Swinging a six foot long polearm at a group of peasants and managing to cut at least one idiot's head off, well that just requires you to show up. Try a few weapons out and see what works for you. And then go and buy a bow and a polearm that could be wielded from horseback. Use the Encyclopedia. I know what you're thinking. Why do you want to read a book? You've already read one book. What's the point in reading another one? But I discovered the importance of the Encyclopedia way too late. For example, if someone mentions someone in chat dialogue, you can click on that name and it appears in the encyclopedia. You can find out all about them, including their last known whereabouts. This is very useful indeed, and I wish I saw it earlier. You can even search for units and see their tech tree. There are details missing that I would like to see, but nevertheless the encyclopedia is very helpful. I relish the idea of wallowing in the pig shit of my own ignorance, but in this game, books good, stupidity bad. As the famous quote goes, leaders are readers. In Bannerlord, there are also frequently rapers and pillagers. But my tactical advice is use the encyclopedia. What you do at the weekends is none of my business. Manage your prisoners wisely. If you want influence, donate prisoners. If you want money, ransom them off in taverns. But if you want some interesting exotic troops, keep them as prisoners until they agree to join you. Then recruit them to the posse when they eventually get tired of being tied up and dragged around for hundreds of miles. Some units take a long time to soften up, but this is a great way to recruit exotic and diverse units in a way that might not otherwise be available to you. Remember that every problem is an opportunity. What do I mean by that? What I think I mean is, keep an eye out for war breaking out on the edges of the territory where you're hanging out. Sure, war, strife and slaughter are truly terrible things. But in Mountain Blade, a war means opportunities for picking off enemy armies, killing the bastards and stealing their shit all done in a guilt-free and morally unambiguous safe space. Well, technically war is a socially approved environment where doing violence and thievery is acceptable, so technically war is a safe space, right? If you're a bloodthirsty sociopathic killer. Mountain Blade 2, colon Bannerlord, is like the collision of the best elements of several games and genres, and it combines them well. It could possibly be described as Medieval Total War, where you can go first slash third person RPG, Kingdom Come Deliverance, where you can RTS the entire kingdom. It's like Mordow, where I don't get my ass kicked repeatedly by 12 year olds, <coughs> or people running automated reaction scripts. Bannerlord manages to combine lots of elements from games I like and collide genres successfully. I really liked the fact that it's part resource management, RTS, strategy wargame, RPG, medieval simulator. I like it, and it's not even finished yet. For me, a lot of this game was plateau and grind, punctuated by moments of total and complete satisfaction. A perfect example of this was the first time I strayed to my borders and picked a fight with a group of enemy soldiers. Previously I'd been mopping up bandits and looters, and now I had my first battle with a competent army of trained units, just as keen to kill me as me them. Fuck me, it was enjoyable, and not just because I won. 
Okay, that was a major factor. But seriously, it was immensely satisfying getting to the point where I could take on serious opponents. And that right there is a massive payoff in this game. As you gain levels of competency with Bannerlord, you experience new levels of satisfaction. The more battles you fight and the better gear you get and the more you train up your soldiers, the more invested you become in your little troop of thugs. You really start to care about your bunch of random murdering fucks. I want to keep playing to make my army better, to learn more about this fictional world and what I can do within it. And already I'm getting tempted to start a new playthrough as a different faction on the hardest settings, just to see what it's like to really battle through it from a different vantage point and different native troops. I want to see this game finished and I very much hope this game is a success both commercially and as a creative enterprise. I will do another video about Bannerlord when it's finally finished and polished. However, I am prepared to say right now that I already got my money's worth. It's 40 quid and I'm still playing, finding new things to do, stuff to steal and factions to piss off, despite its incomplete state. I'm going to recommend this game because it's interesting, challenging, fuckery free and frankly very enjoyable to play. I mean, who doesn't like pillaging and slaughtering peasants, right? Although take it from me, it's even more fun to stick one on some arrogant fucking prince. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Thank you.